Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, to this session of, of this great day here at Tokyo. My name is Paul Dooley. I'm an agent. Some of you may have, may have uh, seen me in action at a bull sale around somewhere in uh, in New South Wales. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Ivan Gant today from uh, from Cassilis, a uh, sheep producer in Cassilis, but also an expert on total digital farm uh, mapping and drones and all subjects related to that. So thanks, Ivan, for giving your time today, and uh, I'm sure we'll all get a lot out of it. The discussion next afternoon. Thank you very much, Paul. <coughs> I have been asked to use the mic for the camera, but seeing the camera's not going, I'm going to put the mic down for a while. And uh, no, we'll just. Uh, the camera's down. Oh, okay. We'll just roll into it. You can probably hear me quite well. But... Okay. Look, um, you've probably come along uh, expecting me to be talking straight about drones. And this session today, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about drones. I'll just briefly uh, start off and talk about some of the work my, I do and um, a little bit of my background. So I've been uh, an agriculture teacher and a farmer at Merriwar. Um, I moved to Merriwar in uh, Central School as a teacher in 1985 and, uh, and so I've been living in that area uh, for all of that time. I um, actually farm in the high country out of Caslis, so up near the cooler tops I run merino sheep and cattle. And I've also had a very strong interest in um, edutech uh, and have been responsible in public education for introducing quite a lot of um, the new connected technologies into public schools in New South Wales. And uh, a lot of that work actually happened um, in the Upper Hunter, or was kicked off in the Upper Hunter, and um, was actually funded by my money so, and some visionaries. So, you know, interesting things happen in, in small communities, and and, uh, and massive change can come out of uh, some of that stuff. The work that um, I guess I've been doing recently, I've had a, as I said, I've been involved in um, EduTech, which is um, in recent years, it's a an international um, community of uh, technology-based learners um, with a specific aim to work in education. But, um, you know, the stuff that's going on in education is also the stuff that's going on in the real world. So um, out of, I guess, that community years ago, I started to learn about um, the tools that Google had and, uh, and one of those tools which I found quite fascinating over the years has been uh, the tool Google My Maps. So I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up if you use any of the Google mapping tools. Great. Who uses My Maps? Good. So we've got a couple of people in the room. And so we'll do a little bit of stuff on that today and, um, and look at what can be done and how easy it is. Who has a Gmail account? Wow, okay, so if you've got a Gmail account, you've already got a My Maps account. So everyone that's got a Gmail account has a, a My Maps account. And you sort of, uh, if you put all this together, you know, Google's been really the, the backbone of some of this big change in education internationally, and uh, especially for email addresses. Every kid in Australia that's in, in school in Australia doesn't matter whether they're in public system, independent uh, Catholic system, all of them have a Gmail address because the um, operation sitting behind their education dot address is Gmail or their Catholic school address is Gmail. So all of them have access to all of the material that um, sits within the, um, in the Google platform. And so we've got this whole lot of young learners throughout the world that are moving along and starting to be able to use technology really rapidly. So um, nowadays I, I don't actually use my user panic book anymore and I'm sure there are a lot of farmers out there. My farm maps on my phone and when I want to find out paddock size or something I just click on the paddock and it's all there. And that's the sort of technology that we've got now amongst our kids. Okay, so look, getting down to what we've got up there on the board. I wanted to really emphasise today that we have a, oh thanks Maria, a 
We've been working together in the Merriwalk community and the broader Upper Hunter community. And really this week we've probably nailed a new training program for farmers and we're calling it AgriSkills Training. And it's all about upskilling farmers in technology areas. It started off a little bit uh, this year where uh, we started to run some uh, drone training and some mapping training, but prior to that we ran a technology session in Merriwar on a farm safety day last year in Merriwar, a technology session at the local show in Merriwar. And that technology session, we started to pull together uh, quite a few uh, local businesses and businesses from a little bit further away that uh, was concentrating on emerging technologies. And they were things like GPS, electric fence control, solar technologies. And out of that, we started to put our heads together about how can we get farmers to really get into this stuff and to learn a little bit more about it in an affordable way? Because all of us have just been throwing money out uh, at feed and uh, trying to keep stock alive and, uh, and there's very little coming in. So I guess this week we finally nailed something that we've been talking about for about six months and that was how to revive some sort of skill set training for farmers. And so we formed a partnership between TAFE because TAFE offers that body of diverse skill sets. Training Services New South Wales because they can actually do the funding and uh, to fund a skill set. And so when I'm talking about a skill set, just very briefly so you understand the, the concept We've been running drone mapping workshops, we've run four of them in the Hunter over the last couple of months, and in those workshops there are two drone competencies and one mapping competency that all come out of the aviation package. For those that are not sure on a competency, if you're doing, if you've done trade, most of you know about trades and things like that, each part of the learning is a unit of competency. And so under the structure for funding uh, training in New South Wales, uh, it works under a program called Smart and Skilled. Each competency has a value tag to it. And so by putting this partnership, local land services, training services, New South Wales, TAFE, DPI, and local community together, we've, able to, we've been able to form a structure that we'll be able to deliver workshops into the future. And so that's where I wanted to start today and that's why I had the, um, this section of upskilling. Now I've got some examples. And if you, and look, these are really starting to just unfold in our minds, uh, solar technology. And I'll just um, I'll give you an example on that one of, uh, probably the main reason that we kicked this off and the main reason I guess six months ago we a few of us ended up in Newcastle in a meeting I priced a new solar pump for one stage I have a three-stage water system to get water up to the top of my mountain uh, for a six and a half kilometer gravity feed system two stages are electric and the third stage is a petrol motor it was going to cost 18 to 20,000 to do that final stage in solar and I just didn't have that money I didn't want to spend that money so I started to do the research and have got the whole lot of the gear ready to go now for around $1,500 how and this is the interesting thing when you look around at what's happening in cities People in cities are continuously upgrading their solar systems on their house roofs. And the reason they're doing that is that the generation of solar technology is changing so rapidly. So we're now up to about fifth generation in the last five, six years since this, or 10 years since this has been going on. But if you're on a farm, you've got lots of room. So I was able to get 
Um, I needed first generation, second generation panels. I needed about 16 to 20. And I actually had um, 20 given to me. So, and they were just sitting in it. The guy had actually just had them pulled off his roof and they were sitting there ready to be carted off to go into a warehouse. Even if I had to buy them from a warehouse in Sydney or Brisbane, the going price for those panels was $600. They're still just as good, but you just need a lot more room. So that's, that's easy, as I said, on the pump. The pump, and this is you know, some, one of the things that we want to do with TAFE and do in this course, is the pump was purchased on Alibaba. Actually, the, probably uh, in multi-stage, um, really uh, good sort of standalone solar pumps, non-submersible, there's only a couple of them made in the world, a couple of companies that make them, and one company's in China. So it was um, $1,200 US land. So, you know, when you start to look at the original price of 18 to 20,000, coming back to a price of somewhere around maximum of 2,000, a bit of knowledge, but that's what we can do in some courses, then the possibilities um, start to be a bit endless. Moving down that list, we can see um, drones farm mapping. So let me just go into that a little bit more. So far, we have done four courses um, and with local land services, and they've been really well received. The feedback has been uh, very positive. And we've had farmers, uh, certainly the last two courses, every farmer went away from those courses with a full farm map. The first course we ran, not so good, but you learn as you go. The second course we started to get a bit better. And we've now got a structure that works really well. Now, as farmers, if you go along to a course, you expect to get something out of it, something that's tangible. If you're going along to do mapping, you'd like to think that you come away with a farm map. I had um, organised a course last year that was um, T&I funded for 40 farmers on the north coast of New South Wales and uh, not one of the farmers ended up with a farm mat and they also came out of it not understanding some of the essential things of farm mapping. So, you know, it takes um, sometimes as educators and the educators that were running that particular course haven't sort of got down to what do we need to get out of this? What do farmers need to get out of this? Farmers need things like their paddocks mapped out, they need that done in a shape or a polygon which tells them the size so when they need to go like I did in Singleton not last week, the week before to buy some summer grass seed because it was predicted to rain, I could just click on the paddocks that I wanted to sow and know exactly what size they were. And that's the sort of stuff that's useful. The, um, look, the drone stuff, I'll um, just talk a little bit about that, but I do have some notes up here on the board that are worth um, browsing over. And the one thing I think, a couple of things that I do want to say about drones, uh, just before I do go further into the presentation. Drones are pretty much used today for uh, just essential jobs, safety. Uh, stuff that allows you to save a little bit of time. So most of the people that I know that are using drones use them to do simple things like go and check the water. So you don't have to jump on the quad, quad and ride to the top of that mountain, uh, spend an hour doing it, because the drone's up there in about 45 seconds. And check the water, you can see the image, everything's right, or you can check the float valve on the on the tank. That, uh, look, that's a really positive thing um, and also a, a something that's pretty important for safety. All of us are, you know, often pushing, uh, pushing the limits on time and, uh, and certainly in the country that I live in where to do the water run, you're 
running, you're going from about 500 metres up to 1,000 metres and then back down again through these valleys and pretty rough roads, it's nice if you can do it another way. The, look, that technology is also trying, uh, changing rapidly and um, I've been sort of partnering with, um, and it's mostly from a, I guess, an aged mentor with a couple of young guys that have, um, Australians that have just had the first autonomous non-defence drone in the world registered uh, just in the last couple of weeks, and that's an agricultural specific drone. Now that drone, and this is the change that's coming, that drone, the expected retail price is going to be in the vicinity of 30,000, lives in its own little solar house that the lid opens up, fits on the back of a ute, you can dump it in the paddock, and it has app control from your phone, and also um, it's got a computer on board, so it's able to do pasture analysis, crop analysis, stock counts, water control, you name it. Um, if any of you have seen today, the electric fence controller out there, Scott's Agri... Um, Agri Ace. Ag Agri Ace uh, system. They, uh, Scott and um, James Roberts, that's developing this drone, um, I put the two of them together just uh, a couple of months ago, and they're now building, or it's now, the drone guy is now building the um, information to take the electric fence data into the drone as it's flying around and also into the uh, transfer stuff. I guess um, what I'm saying there is that uh, technology is moving rapidly and it's not all owned by big companies. Uh, Scott's pretty small, you're dealing with um, some electric fence monitoring stuff that's in that dollars $130 for a single fence monitor and very affordable. These guys that are doing this drone uh, grew up in Tamworth, went to school in Tamworth, have worked internationally for about the last 15 years and are now back at home doing something that's uh, really uh, leading technology in the world and, and uh, bigger properties, even properties around us. I mean, I've, I live near a property called Dalkeith, uh, owned by Aunt Martin. For them, this drone will be ideal. They, that um, Ant's property has uh, one person doing water, which requires a vehicle um, just to get around the place and check water on a daily basis. The drone will do it automatically. And it's just programmed in as one of its chores. So, you know, when you take a Land Cruiser and a person's wage out of it, it's pretty interesting. The, just on wool handling, um, one of the, I think one of the things that, as a wool grower, that I found um, really interesting is that when I first came to the country, I grew up in the city, uh, and my wife was a food scientist, uh, we came to the country, got into merino sheep, and there were no wool classes. and then and. So what we had in our district around Merriwell was we had wool classing courses delivered by TAFE. And my wife used to go off to wool classing once a week and she went off to wool classing for two years and went off to wool classing for four years and I went, I thought you finished wool classing after two years. She said, oh yeah, but look, we, um, all the boys sort of get together at the pub and we sort of go in for a drink and uh, have a get together. And uh, Marie and I were talking about this and we thought, well, yeah, you know, we've just come through, or we're coming through one of the worst droughts ever. We really need some training that's going to be a bit collaborative and a bit ongoing. And uh, so we, we thought, well, wool classing, we've got a whole, pretty well, a whole generation. We've got no young wool classes. Uh, in New South Wales or really across Australia and so we thought well let's see how we can get wool classing in there we know we can't get the qualification but we can start to develop some wool handling things and all of these concepts that we've put up there animal nutrition 
and plus ideas from farmers and rural communities. So we want you people to feed back to us about what sort of training is going to be useful for you. And also, it's not about going to TAFE in Musselbrook or TAFE in Scone and sitting in that TAFE classroom, nearly. All of the training courses we've run have been mobile. Certainly, you might have TAFE doing the delivery, but if we're going to be doing something on solar stuff, it's going to happen in a real area where something ends up being constructed. Obviously, welding and things like that needs to be done in a workshop. So please think about uh, what I'm saying and think about how we can get this sort of um, delivery going. Uh, hello everyone. I did my Waterwise course back in the 80s. I haven't been able to access any more irrigation courses since then. Uh, that enabled me to get funding and put my irrigation dam in and I've got a 45 acre irrigation system at home. But I think there's training needed to be done so perhaps I can go on the list. Thank you very much. Anybody got any, any other ideas? Uh, can I just ask about your solar pump, uh, what you pump out of and do you have to get a, a water access licence? Okay, uh, the solar pump is actually pumping out of a tank, um, as I said, three stages up a mountain and I have a well, Stockwater well, which was, has been on the property since I purchased it and uh, and I don't have a water access licence, it's not for irrigation, just for um, stock water. Um, I'd just uh, like to suggest uh, alternative stock water systems. Um, uh, there's a fair bit of technical guidance required on pumps and, uh, and pipe sizes and everything else. So um, uh, I think these days, well, one of the speakers today said stock uh, watering out of dams uh, will produce less uh, red um, dark cuts. So there's another plus for um, stock water, but given our changes in climate, etc., and droughts, um, alternative stock water systems um, might be the go in future years. Um, I was actually just clicking on that pipe. Once you, unfortunately, once you get these, once you get these things onto sometimes on screen, you can't get the details. And I think that that's a really important um, part of this. Uh, knowing what you've got, that's the um, pipeline around our place. And, and as you click on the, the pipeline in different areas, um, you can see that section there is 32 mil poly um, P and 10. So, and this is one of the things with this, um, Google My Maps, so uh, you've got uh, a name once you start to create a polygon, once you start to create a line or something like that, you can um, put the information in there. You don't have to put much because in, in reality, all you want to know about um, if you've got a pipe on your farm is where that pipe is and, um, and preferably what it is because there's nothing worse than um, you get your box of pipe fittings out and you go, oh gee, was that bit up there metric or was that imperial poly? And then you go out with the wrong fitting and you've spent an hour driving out there and then you've got to come back and get the next fitting. Or you've got to load your vehicle up with all of the different fittings and it takes you, again, half an hour to load it up to make sure you've got every fitting with you. So it's um, this whole, I've found this mapping um, really interesting and also very easy and I think to describe the ease I, I still did a little bit of casual teaching and so last Friday week I was at Cassis Primary School and we've been building this understanding of mapping now for a long time the the notes and things up for a long time and we've now got it at a stage where um, I think they're pretty much self-teaching so you can read the map plug or you can start by sort of going into Google My Maps 
putting in the search line up here, sticking your address in there, and um, up comes your approximately your farm. You just um, click on this tool here, which is draw a line, add a line, and start and draw a shape around your farm. And then if your farm happens to, um, we'll just leave it there, if your farm happens to be around that sort of blackened area there, all you do is you just drag it into fit the area. And you can also do things like, if you've got a neighbour that's, um, you know, got a whole lot of stuff around here, <laughs> Maria will start laughing now, yeah. uh, and you sort of go, I don't know what all that is. Can anyone tell me what all that stuff there is? It's got an orange. It's probably the worst St John's Wort in fact, uh, area in uh, probably in the Upper Hunter, but maybe one of the worst ones in um, New South Wales. And you know, if you've got that sort of thing, you can actually, because you're using Google Maps, because. Um, and if we go and have a look at the Google technology, we go and have a look at this now on Google Earth. The beauty of Google Earth is it has a whole lot of historical stuff. So we can take the map out of, um, that we've created, that we've drawn up, and drop it into Google Earth, and we can do a whole lot of, of extra stuff with it. So we can measure the real length of that fence line which is going down through that valley that we can't measure on the flat plane surface. So it just makes the process really easy. We can go back in historical time and we can buy, we can see in different images, and you can see on this image how clear that St John's Wort is. Uh, and you know, you, um, we bought the place um, 30 years ago knowing that was there, but if you um, don't do anything about it, it just gets worse. So you've just got to make sure that you look after your own country, but you also put a little bit of pressure on um, others around you to make sure that uh, they do a little bit of looking after stuff as well. Any questions? You can, um, look, you can add um, waypoints in. The beauty of, um, when you're mapping on, uh, say, any, any mapping tool, you actually create a file, which is a KML or KMZ or GPS, or there's numerous file types. And then that file can be put into different apps. So, um, I have an app on my phone uh, which is just called My Tracks, and uh, there's lots and lots of apps. And I found My Tracks on an Android is, um, is pretty much as good as a GPS, um, handheld GPS tracker. And so I can, as I'm going along, I can put waypoints in, into the phone. I use that app, I'm a really keen backcountry skier. I turn that app on when I go out skiing nowadays, turn, put the screen on blank, and it'll last for ages. So just like any other GPS tool. And uh, it's a really valuable tool to have in your pocket. Um, and so when you're going around the farm, if uh, all the tracks that, I'll just go back to that map, and uh, we can have a look at some of the features a bit, a bit more closely. The other thing with this is that you can turn off layers so you don't have to have too much stuff on there. And I can even turn off the paddocks. Um, so 
now I can just see the tracks and I've obviously left something else on, I've left the water points on. You can just see the tracks on the farm, the orange line. So all of those tracks have actually been generated by just having that in my pocket with my tracks on. So just jump on the quad, ride along a specific track. And when you're doing tracks uh, or doing waypoints, if you're not used to doing GPS stuff, if you want that track to be one track, you just ride it in one track. Or if you want that one to be a separate track, you just click it, start, record, stop when you get to the end of it. And just put a name in there. And you know, it's a very simple thing. If you want to put your water points in, again, those waypoints and things can all go in that way. So you don't need a fancy GPS to do any of this sort of stuff now. And that's what we're trying to get through to people and teach them in these courses. Yes. So you can do the same thing in that, but what's the advantage of using just Google Maps? Okay. My Maps. Okay. Google My Maps is um, a tool, and really it's still a, um, very much in a rudimentary stage. Built as a beta tool, meaning from a software point of view, never launched onto the market to be a fully fledged application or program. We call most stuff now in IT apps. So. Um, but it's your map generator, so it's your drawing tool to get the shapes and get all the information down. And it also has export capacity. When, when Google first built it, uh, I can remember when they released it about eight or nine years ago, and they did the build because they're in autonomous cars and stuff like that. That's what it's all about. And, and positioning and advertising, so when you put your business on there. They didn't actually have a KML file in there, but Google is so responsive to the Edutech community that I sent an email and the next morning there was a KML file in there. And of course they just keep building it, feedback to them, and they add stuff that you know can be added. Uh, so now it has the KMZ, which is a whole database behind it. So your My Maps is draw the lines, put the points on. And what that does is it's putting all those lines with little points on the map that have GPS positioning. Then you can take that file and save or download that file and put it into Google Earth Pro. So to get, so when I was in Google Earth just a minute ago, to get my farm map into Google Earth, I simply go into file and import import a file. So I can import, what else have I got? Um, you could create it directly in Google Earth Pro. You could, but you don't have the same tools. The tools just don't work as well in Google Earth Pro. Yeah, but it's certainly my maps is what, uh, yeah, my maps is important. I'll show you something else that is important with Google, I think, that is worth trying to understand. Um, obviously Google's about money and the company making money, but if you use various Google accounts, and so if you had one of those people that put their hand up for a Gmail account, you have your Gmail data, you have a Photos, Google Photos space, you have a My Maps space, now you can com and you have a Google Drive space. You can combine all of those into Google Drive, but if you do, you only have the maximum data of your drive, which is about 14 gigabytes or something like that. But otherwise, you have quite an immense, something like about 25 gigabytes of free space. So your My Maps account keeps all your maps. And so this one here is a file that from LLS and and this is one of the things that we're doing in the workshops, uh, giving out the property title boundaries. And so basically, and we can take the colour off that seat and put a satellite image and things underneath it. But the beauty of the My Maps is that's your working book, if you like. And also it stores all your maps in, in that one spot. Okay. 
Yes. Can you get, um, I must pass the mic around because the questions are always. <laughs> can you get soil moisture and pasture growth and that sort of thing through that map? Yeah, look, that's a, a really good question. And um, the answer is yes, but the best way to get it is to um, use the, the drone to do fly, fly over with an NVDI um, or infrared imaging with a drone. To, get, to really get that, you need to be um, doing it on a regular basis. So some of you may be aware of a program called Pastures from Space, and Pastures from Space started out in, uh, well, it started out from a research program in 1990, 1987, sorry. Uh, with Landsat stuff and we were getting Landsat images of our farm uh, back in, when we first started that in 1989 at spring images but from the point of view of pasture growth and nutrient stuff they were pretty poor because there was no benchmarking between say uh, September, end of September, October, you need that on a regular basis to get that information and the other thing you need is ground truthing uh, the guy that I work with, uh, Ben Watts, that does the, uh, the drone work is um, really into this and Ben will just simply say, to get good information, you've got to have good backup. And one of the things that I've suggested that LLS do to support us as farmers is that maybe LLS might purchase a drone deploy account because drone deploy is the analysis, cloud-based analysis tool that allows us to do all this stuff. Um, so they've, they've got the background images, combination of Landsat and all of the other freeware images sitting in the back of their cloud-based software. So when your drone flies over and you bring it back, grab the, plug the USB port, uh, USB into your drone and uh, just over here get the download the information from the camera underneath as long as it's um, capable of doing multispectral in other words light reflection in the infrared spectrum then upload it into drone deploy all that information comes back so we're hoping that LLS uh, uh, support us with that and you know a little bit of needling from some of you people can always help thanks for that question <laughs> How much is that? well look a, a good um, uh, high-end advanced drone deploy cut it's about 10 grand a year so it's out of the range farmers just can't afford that any other questions might be fairly simple. But say you want to pipe water from a header down and you just want to siphon the water back down to the house or something. How, can you get your points, your level points with a GPS? Or can I just run a cursor along on my maps or something and work out the levels so I can draw a line and then go out in the paddock and dig holes? Okay, see the I'm following the water line now. Can you see down the bottom of the screen? There's the elevation. Uh, I'm following the water line on my farm now, and you can see the elevation. When I put this water pipeline in, I put it in with a handheld altimeter. And gosh, if I was putting it in today, I'd be putting it in with Google Earth and I'd be spot on down the ridge lines. The same way I put in fences, I never put in a fence now unless I can see it on Google Earth and then work out exactly where I want to go down a particular ridge line and keep them as straight as possible. So you do everything sitting on Google Earth. It, it'll just plot, you just draw your pipeline in and get your levels. You'll find with that, you'll get everything spot on and then your dozer operator that's putting it in just needs something like a little uh, trimble, you know, the cheap um, positioning trimble device. Um, could use a mobile phone, but the problem with mobile phone tracking, if you're using it to try and track a dozer or a tractor or something like that, is they don't refresh quickly enough. Whereas a trimble 
will refresh instantaneously. So you, so we just take that line, load that um, into the Trimble as a shape file, and away you go. And it's just the dozer will just sail along the other phone. Yeah, but points, so you yeah, because you can put all of those points. Um, you've, you've got them all. The, the line actually has, because it's coming out of a KMZ file, that has all that data in there. Uh, one, one thing when you're doing mapping, it's worth thinking that the common files that are used are KML, and it was the start, and we're only talking a couple of years ago, but that's just a line type thing. KMZ, which is pretty much everyone is using now, that is the line plus all the data, the position, the altitude, uh, and any description that you put in there. So if I want to put in um, a whole lot of description about a pump and photos of the pump and the manual, I can put all of that into that in the back of that. So I can put a marker point on the map and just here at this water trough. And uh, because we're on Google, and this is another disadvantage with using Google Earth Pro, because it doesn't give us all the data. Whereas we drop back into my maps now, and turn the water stuff back on so that we can see it and we can see we can see where that water point is and if I put the description in there and I could have photographs and whole works in there and all of that will come up whole manual can be in there and it'll come up. Any further questions? I didn't want to take it much further than this, except I'll just come back to the training. I've got a whole lot of these pamphlets here. Um, I want you to take them to just remind you that um, these training courses will be available. I think the way that you're going to do it uh, is probably your database, Maria, from LLS, or...? No, the contact number is Lynn at um, Tay. Sorry. The contact number on the flyers is Lynn at TAFE. He'll just be compiling lists. What we're aiming to do, if there's a small community, like your local hall, we can run them anywhere from Taree to Bunnan, Merriwar, um, might be just a local group of farmers or the land care group. Um, really, we can run it from 10 people to 20 or 30 and it can be tailored for you. So, for instance, we did have um, some people that were really keen on doing the drone training and the farm mapping but their computer skills might not be up to speed. So we can include, as Ivan spoke earlier when he mentioned competencies, we can include some basic computer skills. Um, if it's chemical training you're interested in, we can also put in weed identification, um, just anything that's going to help your group. So the idea is they're locally tailored, locally delivered, and we're not dictating what we think you need to know. Um, it's basically you can come to us. So there's the funding was available through Training Services New South Wales, local land services and DPI are helping put the groups together. Um, the idea is you can get off the farm, get out and meet other people. You might prefer to have a two-day program. You might like to meet every Tuesday night, a bit like the wool classing group that went on for years. Um, it's basically what suits you. So don't feel that it's inflexible or anything like that and the idea today was for Ivan just to give you a taster of what's involved. At Mary War um, we had about 15 people uh, and they found the drones just fascinating, just getting in there, working out how easy they were, looking at what price points, what was available. Um, the farm safety aspect is just amazing. So where people go away from the day sort of thinking 
that they'll, they can put together their own farm, farm map through our LLS GIS system. They gave us their customer reference number, so we were able to have that map file ready. That's why, as Ivan mentioned, we've been learning as we've gone along. So we're, they were a step ahead when they got to the course. Um, you know, their property might have been five hectares or 500 hectares, but they could just get straight into the program. And then um, others decided that, you know, they could really utilise, they used how easy it was to fly the drone, um, landing, learned a few tips from our trainer on um, how to manoeuvre the drones. A couple of people already had them and brought along their own drones. So we cater for the individual. So you know, anything's possible, as I think Ivan's mentioned. And you can, if you're interested, you can also call local land services, talk to your local rural support worker at Scone or Taree, at all the TAFE numbers on there, and I'm sure Ivan's also available to have a chat if that's what you're interest, interested in. Certainly, um, certainly available to have a chat. We've had 60 people do the farm mapping and drone courses, about 60 so far. And um, the, it's interesting talking about a community because the people have been coming back to both Ben and myself on a regular basis, asking questions, and really that's what learning should be about. It shouldn't be about you go into a course and you finish and that's it, because uh, a lot of us, we all learn it in different ways, and some of us will go away and go, gosh, what was all that about? I need to know something. And so what I'm doing uh, with the mapping notes is I'm updating them all of the time. As, as we find new information, they get updated and we send out an email to recipients that have been in the course so that they can see what's happening. Just something um, Maria said that we provided the shape for. See the white line? The white line is the property boundary, the title boundary on my farm. And out of the 60 people we've had, to pretty most of them have been like that. And you can see where I've taken a lot more to the north there and um, down on the creek flats uh, as well, some of the nice nice land. Well, it wasn't me that took it. It was actually the original, when it was a subdivision block, the, this was all owned by the Busby family at Cassilis. And, you know, they just basically said, well, the fence goes along the, the road and, and we can't fence up that you know, you just can't fence straight up there because it's just so steep. And so that's what give and take's all about. The interesting thing is that when you start to look at the legislation for title boundaries and things, the title boundary has no reflection on the ownership of the land because you, like all of you, you've been working your land for a period of time. So your land is where your fences are. And one of the things that we're actually some discussion just today with the local land services, and we'd had this about a month ago, with dog baiting, um, we need to get a better understanding of where people's real boundaries are. Because when you're doing aerial baiting programs and things, you can't be um, dropping baits sort of in there if that's part of um, an ecological land area that's locked up, but you can be dropping baits in there because the wild dogs might be coming in from that um, mine offset country. And a drone could drop it there. Okay, that's it. I'll hand back to, I think, to Paul. Did you want to finish? No, no, I think that, that, that's good. Thanks, um, thanks, Ivan. We've covered a, a wide range of, um, of topics here this afternoon that, that many of them could obviously be a, a session on their own. I think the takeaway is that as uh, Maria said, if you'd like to have a, a course of some sort, get in contact with the LLS and, uh, and they can organise it. Please thank uh, Ivan for coming along today. <laughs> and I'm sure Ivan will hang around for a while now if you'd like to sort of have a yarn. Thank you.